Hello, welcome to the A Book A Day channel. Today, I'm going to interpret the book Where Does Money Come From for you. It aims to answer how money is created and distributed in modern society, and the significant impacts it has on the economy. When it comes to where money comes from, you might think it's simple. Just look at the banknotes and coins in your wallet, and you'll know they are printed by the central bank. However, these banknotes and coins only make up a small portion of the total money supply. For example, in most countries today, only 3% of the currency structure is physically printed and issued by the central bank, with the remaining 97% being created through other means. You might find it surprising, but the majority of the money supply in modern economies is actually created and distributed by commercial banks through lending. This means that every time someone takes out a loan to buy a house, a car, or start a business, new money is created. In other words, the vast majority of the money we use daily is controlled and distributed by commercial banks, and we all participate in the creation of money. Furthermore, you might not realize that banks don't need deposits to make loans, they can create deposits with loans. The constraints on money creation by commercial banks, such as capital adequacy ratios and reserve requirements, are quite limited. The real determining factor is the confidence of the banks. In other words, banks are not just intermediaries for lending money, they are the source of creating money for the economy. The role of central banks in money creation is more passive than many people imagine. The conclusions in this book are quite astonishing, but they are rigorously argued. It was written by four British financial scholars who examined over 500 documents and operational guidelines from central banks, regulatory authorities, and other financial institutions, and it has received recognition from authoritative scholars. For instance, it is endorsed by Charles Goodhart, a fellow of the British Academy and the originator of Goodhart's Law. In essence, the cutting edge knowledge in finance is not found in research institutions or university classrooms, but in the counters where banks interact with customers and in the negotiations of business deals. When this knowledge is put into papers and textbooks, it becomes outdated and loses its vitality. Therefore, the knowledge presented in this book is more real, accurate, and up-to-date than what we typically find in textbooks. Of course, the creation and distribution of money isn't just a matter of knowledge, it's also a matter of interest. The credit money created by banks doesn't flow evenly. Due to incentive mechanisms, banks tend to lend to customers with collateral or assets, rather than for productive investments. As a result, incremental funds are more likely to flow into real estate and financial speculation rather than into small businesses and manufacturing, affecting the interests of different social groups. So, the content of this book is worth the attention of everyone. Next, I will break down this book into three parts for you. The first part explores how money is created and the role banks play in this process. The second part delves into how the quantity of money created by banks is determined and what role central banks can play. Finally, the third part examines where the money created by banks flows and its significant impacts on the economy. I hope that the exploration of these questions will unveil the mystery of money creation for you and help you understand your position and interests within the modern financial system. Part 1. First, let's examine how money is created. In other words, where does the money we use every day come from? For this question, an ordinary person might think that money is simply printed by the government, while someone with some knowledge of economics might understand that money is issued by the central bank. Central bank issued money, according to the fractional reserve system, circulates through the lending and deposit operations of commercial banks. Let's illustrate this with an example. Imagine a small town with a bank where the central bank mandates a 10% reserve requirement. A worker deposits $1,000 in this bank. The bank sets aside 10% as a legal reserve, which amounts to $100, and lends the remaining $900 to a farmer. The farmer uses this $900 to purchase furniture from a carpenter, who in turn, deposits the $900 back into the bank. The bank, once again, reserves 10%, which is $90, and lends the remaining $810 to a stonemason, and so on. This process continues, creating new loans and deposits each time, eventually increasing the total money supply to as much as $10,000. This is what textbooks refer to as the money multiplier model. According to this model, most people believe that banks are merely intermediaries for circulating money and have no influence on the money supply in the economy. They think that the real control over the quantity of money lies with the central bank, which can issue new base money and set reserve requirements. The growth of the money supply is believed to be constrained by the reserve ratio and the amount of base money. However, this book tells us that reality is quite different. In many countries, reserve requirements are extremely low, or even non-existent, and impose minimal constraints on commercial banks' lending activities. 
Furthermore, in the banking sector, loans are not created from deposits but can be used to create deposits. In modern society, the vast majority of the circulating money is created by commercial banks. To illustrate this point, let's consider a case. Imagine that Jackie wants to renovate his house, but doesn't have enough money. He goes to Citibank to borrow $100,000. The bank reviews his income and credit history, deeming him a reliable customer, who can repay the loan on time. The bank and Jackie sign a contract stipulating that Jackie must repay the $100,000 plus interest within three years. This contract is a valuable asset for the bank because it represents the money Jackie owes them, which the bank records as an asset on its balance sheet. Simultaneously, the bank opens a new account for Jackie and credits it with $100,000. This $100,000 becomes a deposit for Jackie, but it's a liability for the bank because Jackie can withdraw it at any time. The bank records this as a liability on its balance sheet. In this way, the bank expands its balance sheet. In reality, it merely enters some numbers into a computer to represent the lending arrangement between Jackie and the bank. This loan enables Jackie to spend up to $100,000 through various means, such as his car checks or transfers, making it function like money. Now, let's assume Jackie wants to pay his rent to his landlord, Peter, with this money. What happens to the bank accounts? If Jackie and Peter both use the same bank, the transfer is straightforward. Jackie informs the bank, and the bank adjusts the numbers in their accounts. No physical cash is involved, and there's no need to involve the central bank. However, if Jackie and Peter use different banks, such as Jackie banking with Citibank, and Peter with Standard Chartered, the transfer process becomes more complex. One approach is for Jackie to withdraw $5,000 in cash handed to Peter, and Peter then deposits it into his account. This method is quite inconvenient, banks have two better methods. One is through the direct transfer of funds between their accounts at other banks, simply reconciling the amounts owed between them. This is known as bilateral clearing. The other method involves the banks utilizing their accounts at the central bank. Just as individuals have accounts with a bank, each bank also maintains an account with the central bank, known as a reserve account. In the same way that we need to maintain a sufficient balance to make payments, banks must also maintain a certain level of reserves to make payments to other banks. When a bank's reserve falls short, it can either sell securities to the central bank to increase its reserves, or borrow directly from the central bank to bolster its reserves, expanding the central bank's balance sheet in the process. So if Jackie makes a $5,000 cross-bank payment to Peter, how do the accounts change? We can break it down into five steps. First, Jackie informs Citibank to transfer $5,000 to Peter. Second, Citibank adjusts the numbers on Jackie's account, reducing it by $5,000. Third, Citibank informs the central bank to transfer $5,000 from its reserve account to Standard Chartered's reserve account. Fourth, the central bank adjusts the numbers, reducing Citibank's reserve account by $5,000 and increasing Standard Chartered's reserve account by $5,000. Fifth, Standard Chartered informs Peter that his account has been credited with $5,000. The transaction is now complete. What are the results? The central bank's reserve balance remains unchanged Citibank's reserve is reduced by $5,000, and Standard Chartered's reserve is increased by $5,000. Citibank's liability to Jackie decreases by $5,000, reducing its asset from the central bank. Meanwhile, Standard Chartered's liability to Peter increases by $5,000, increasing its asset from the central bank. In this way, the balance sheets of the central bank and the banks remain balanced and equal. From this, we understand that, in modern society, Apart from a small amount of paper money and coins, most of the currency is simply digital entries in computers. Whether it's our deposits or central bank reserves, they are just various forms of digital data. Additionally, banking operations, loans can be used to create deposits. Commercial banks are the primary source of money creation. But with this knowledge, you might wonder, can banks create money without limitations? Part 2. This is related to what we are going to discuss next. What factors do banks consider when creating money? And what role can central banks play in it? We can look at it from three perspectives. Interest rates, reserve ratios, and capital adequacy ratios. First, let's look at interest rates. People typically believe that the quantity of money created by banks is controlled by the central bank through interest rate adjustments. The higher the interest rate, the more profit banks make from lending. But it also increases the burden on borrowers. If interest rates decrease, bank profits decrease, but the pressure on borrowers is reduced. 
Central banks can adjust interest rates according to the economic environment to influence the scale of lending and money supply. However, this book tells us that the main factor determining how much banks lend is not interest rates, but their confidence in the borrower's ability to repay, and the stability of the financial system. Banks are more concerned with avoiding loan defaults, and the importance of obtaining high interest rates is not as significant because of the loan defaults. The bank may lose the entire principal. If banks have confidence in the future economic conditions, they will issue more loans and create more money. Conversely, if they lack confidence in the future economic conditions, they will reduce lending and create less money. Therefore, the scale of lending in a country's money supply depend more on banks' outlook for the future. Now, let's look at reserve ratios. This is the proportion of cash, or other liquid assets, that commercial banks hold at the central bank for emergencies or transfers. Generally, we think that the higher the reserve ratio, the less money banks have available for loans or investments, and the lower the reserve ratio, the more money banks can lend or invest. Central banks can control credit creation and money supply by adjusting reserve ratios. In reality, the ability of banks to create new money is not significantly related to their reserve balances at the central bank. As mentioned earlier, reserve ratio requirements in many countries are very low. For example, during the financial crisis, UK banks only needed to hold one pound and 25 pence and reserve for every 100 pounds of credit issued. This is because the electronic clearing systems in which banks participate perform multilateral netting at the end of each business day. So banks actually need to hold very little in reserves to meet their payment obligations. The author even suggests that it's not the central bank that controls the scale of credit created by commercial banks. Instead, it's the commercial banks that determine the central bank's reserve balances. The central bank needs to maintain these balances to ensure the smooth operation of the financial system. Now, let's focus on capital adequacy ratios. Capital adequacy ratios refer to the ratio of a bank's own capital, such as equity, and retained earnings to its risk assets, such as loans. This ratio reflects the bank's ability to absorb losses on its risk assets with its own capital. According to international standards, banks are required to have a capital adequacy ratio of at least 8%. This means that for every $92 in loans issued, there needs to be $8 in capital to support them. Many people believe that capital adequacy ratios can limit a bank's lending and asset size. However, the author of this book believes that capital adequacy ratios do not necessarily limit credit creation. This is because retained earnings can be considered as capital, and a bank that is highly profitable can retain more earnings which can then be used to support more loans while still meeting capital adequacy requirements. For example, if a bank made a profit of $10 million last year, with $5 million in retained earnings counted as capital, it now has an additional $5 million in capital that can be used to support more risk assets. According to an 8% capital adequacy requirement, this $5 million can support $62.5 million in new loans. If the bank maintains strong profitability, it can continue to expand its lending while still meeting capital adequacy requirements. Of course, if a bank's profitability decreases, the amount of capital available for retention will also decrease, and as a result, the lending capacity will be restricted. However, this does not mean that capital adequacy ratio requirements directly limit the issuance of loans. It's the bank's operating conditions that affect its lending capacity. So while capital adequacy ratio requirements have an impact on a bank's resparing capacity, and the scale of its lending, they do not directly limit credit creation. What really affects credit creation is a bank's profitability. Furthermore, an increase in capital adequacy ratios may not necessarily prevent banks from increasing lending when the economic conditions are favorable. This is because firstly, economic booms often come with the appreciation of assets or collateral, which makes banks reduce their risk estimates for loans, thus reducing their capital requirements and allowing banks to issue more loans while maintaining the same capital adequacy ratio. Secondly, optimistic economic outlooks encourage banks to issue more loans, generate more profits, increase capital, and enable banks to issue more loans. Thirdly, if regulatory authorities treat an increase in capital adequacy ratios as a counter-cyclical macroprudential policy, banks will find it easier to raise more capital. For example, funds raised by banks, such as purchasing newly issued preferred stock, are ultimately created by the banking system, and the funds created during boom periods will increase. So we must not forget a key fact. Banks are creators of the money supply. Requiring banks to raise more capital during prosperous times does not necessarily prevent prosperity. This prosperity is caused by an increase in bank lending, 
and banks can expand their balance sheets by using a portion of the money supply to finance a higher capital ratio. Therefore, capital adequacy ratios do not limit the creation of money or the expansion of bank balance sheets. In summary, the money supply in a modern economy is primarily created through credit creation, and the impact of policies such as interest rates, reserve ratios, and capital adequacy ratios on credit creation is limited. The quantity of money in a country is mainly determined by the expectations of banks about the future, which is the result of decisions made by individual banks on lending and asset purchases. Part 3. So, when banks create credit and expand the money supply, where does the created money flow, and what impact does it have on the socio-economy? To address this question, it is essential to understand that when banks create credit, the impact on the economy differs depending on whether the money is used for GDP transactions or non-GDP transactions. GDP transactions are those related to production and consumption, such as buying goods and services or investing in fixed assets. Non-GDP transactions involve the transfer of existing assets, such as real estate, stocks, bonds, and so on. When banks create credit, if this money is used for GDP transactions, it promotes economic growth and employment. These loans are used for producing new products, services, or improving productivity, increasing total demand and total supply in society, leading to non-inflationary growth. This type of credit creation is productive and enhances societal welfare and economic efficiency. However, if this money is used for non-GDP transactions, it leads to asset price inflation, bubbles bursting, and misallocation of resources. These loans are used to purchase existing assets and do not increase total demand and total supply, but only drive up asset prices. As asset prices rise, people feel wealthier, increasing their consumption expenditure, leading to inflation. At the same time, banks may relax lending standards due to the appreciation of collateral, further exacerbating credit expansion and asset bubbles. When these bubbles burst, asset prices plummet, and banks may tighten lending standards due to declining collateral values, further intensifying credit contraction and financial crises. This type of credit creation is non-productive and harms societal welfare and economic efficiency. So in practice, which type of transactions do banks tend to lend to? The answer is non-GDP transactions. Incentives determine that banks are more willing to lend to customers with collateral or assets, rather than lending for productive investments. The former has lower risks, higher returns, less regulation, and less competition. Therefore, during a period of credit expansion, incremental funds are more likely to flow towards real estate and financial speculation, rather than towards small businesses and manufacturing. This has profound implications for the socio-economy. We can illustrate this with two examples. The root cause of the 2008 global financial crisis lay in the credit bubble in the U.S. real estate market. U.S. banks, in a lax regulatory and low interest rate environment, issued a large number of subprime loans to borrowers with poor credit. These loans were packaged into financial derivatives and circulated globally. When house prices were rising, these loans appeared safe, and both banks and investors profited abundantly. But when house prices fell, these loans became unpayable and banks and investors faced difficulties, leading to a financial crisis and economic recession. The outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 also had a significant impact on the global economy. To address the demand contraction and supply disruptions caused by the pandemic, governments and central banks worldwide implemented unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus measures, significantly increasing public expenditure and credit creation. While these measures partially eased the economic downturn, they also brought inflation risks. During the crisis, some countries adopted quantitative easing policies. When interest rates were already at or near zero, central banks increased the base money supply by purchasing long-term bonds like government bonds, encouraging spending and borrowing. This improved market confidence and to some extent mitigated the impact of the financial crisis and economic recession. However, it might lead to the problems mentioned earlier. Because central banks purchasing bonds doesn't directly create new credit for households, businesses, or governments. Rather, financial investment departments might create new credit, which they may invest in corporate bonds, stocks, or derivative trades and commodities, driving up the prices of these assets. At the same time, companies that can raise funds by issuing bonds or stocks might choose to use these funds to pay off existing bank debts instead of investing in productive activities. This results in a contradictory effect, where the reduction in credit creation and money supply is equal to the increase in quantitative easing. In conclusion, an increase in the money supply doesn't necessarily promote economic growth. It depends on how this money is used. If we aim for sustainable development, 
we need to change the incentives for bank lending, directing more funds toward productive investments rather than non-productive speculation. Only then can newly created money benefit society. Conclusion With this the interpretation of this book is coming to an end. Let's summarize. This book, Where Does Money Come From?, is a knowledge manual about money and banking written by four British financial scholars based on first-hand information and expert interviews using plain language. While delving into monetary and banking theory and the history of financial development, it presents some groundbreaking new theories challenging traditional beliefs. The primary viewpoint is that the majority of the money supply in modern economies is created by commercial banks through credit creation. It also emphasizes several key points. Firstly, in the real world with incomplete information transparency, credit is allocated by banks. The primary factor determining bank lending isn't interest rates, but rather banks' confidence in borrowers' ability to repay loans and their confidence in the liquidity and solvency of other banks and the entire financial system. Secondly, while capital adequacy requirements may have some impact, they are not necessarily effective in preventing excessive credit expansion and asset price bubbles. Thirdly, banks determine the destination of credit in the economy. Due to incentive mechanisms, banks tend to lend to customers with collateral or assets, rather than for productive investments, and this has profound consequences for the socio-economy. These insights are valuable for understanding the operation of the monetary system, improving monetary policy regulation, and enhancing the efficiency of financial supervision. Finally, it's worth noting that the government does not directly participate in the creation and distribution of money. But this doesn't mean that the government has no influence on money. It is the government's endorsement that makes money a universally accepted unit of account and means of payment. Only a responsible and trustworthy government can shape a stable currency. That concludes my interpretation of this book. If you're interested in the book's content, I encourage you to read the original. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to share it with your friends. Congratulations, you've just finished another book.